Hi, and welcome to a Calculus 1 video on average rate of change or slope. Now this video is probably the first video in a series of videos that will complete this section. This is meant to be all of those prerequisite skills that you saw in any pre-calculus course that you took. Again, pre-calculus is anything before you entered calculus. Um, so we're going to take a look at average rate of change in slope um, in great detail because then when you get to the class for your Calculus 1 class you can talk about the tangent line problem and what it means to be a limit and all of that. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay, so we'll get to our first example here in a second, but I would like to just write out a couple quick things here for you. So slope, we should know or you should be able to think of it as average rate of change. Those terms should be interchangeable and most likely you spent a lot more time with the slope terminology than you did the average rate of change, but really that's just a vocabulary addition if you um, haven't studied average rate of change in great detail. Now if we think about slope then, we also could say that it is rise over run. Hopefully you were able to kind of come up with that even before it came out of my mouth. And we also saw the formula for it, which I like to just write as change in Y over change in X or change in output over change in input. That is also Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So these were the three different representations that we really saw for the formula for slope and calculating it. Now again, if you aren't as familiar with this um, change in y over change in x, that's really just your y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. It's just in a little bit more legible form um, because it really doesn't matter which point you call the first or the second. So in order to find slope, you either needed a graph where you could identify two points and you could physically count your rise over run, or you needed to identify two points from a function and then you could find the slope or average rate of change using that formula. So let's take a look at our first example. Again, these will sort of be the pre-calc concepts that are going to be necessary so you can have a good calculus discussion um, in your class. So number one says, if a ball is thrown into the air with a velocity of 40 feet per second, its height in feet t seconds later is given by y equals 40t minus 16t squared. And I'm going to go ahead and highlight this so I can keep it and have it very handy because I'm going to need that even for my calculator portion. So the the thing that I want to do with you right now is question A, which says find the average velocity over the given time intervals. So there's a couple of vocab words that I want to just make sure we know right off the bat. Average velocity is also another term for average rate of change, or in other words, slope. And then over the given time intervals, so if I look at this first question, it says 1 comma 2 in the brackets. So that is saying from t equals 1 to t equals 2. Those are my inputs because this was the time interval. So it's going from 1 to 2 and those are my inputs for time. So if you think back to what you needed to calculate slope, we already kind of talked about it, you need two points. And if I only have the input value, now I'm asking you to find that output value. So I have the independent variable t, t equals 1 and t equals 2. I could substitute that in by hand and do something like this, y equals 40 times 1 minus 16 times 1 squared because I was inputting 1 or substituting in 1 for t and do that computation. But again, that was assessed in a previous course. So whether you do that by hand or do that using your technology, it's really neither here nor there to me. Make sure you ask your teacher what they prefer. Um, but 
most often times they just want you to get to this point. I am writing these as coordinate pairs, so as their x comma y, or in this case t comma y, input comma output, ordered pairs. So if t equals 1, I can see my, from my computation above that it would be 40 minus 16, which would be 24. But let's say I don't want to do all of this computation by hand. Let's go to our graphing calculator and I'll show you an easier way um, to get some of this computation done efficiently. All right, so I have my graphing calculator here. Let's turn it on. And what I will do is go to the y equals, which hopefully you can sort of follow along with my arrows here. So y equals, and I'll type in my function that I was given, 40t, which I can use the x for input, minus 16x, which is again right next to that green alpha there, that's your input, squared. Okay, and now what what you could do, there's a couple different routes for computation. You can use your home screen, um, your calculate menu, all of that. You can look at the graph. I'm going to use the table because I think most of my students use the table. So let's make our table be efficient for us. Right now, if we look at our table, all of our tables are probably going to look different because they all probably have a starting x value of whatever that might be and then we all have a change in table of something. Maybe at some point you put it to a half, so the increments here would be by a half, or maybe it's by a tenth, but it's a constant change in your table. So for me right now, my change in table is one, which means my inputs will constantly increase by one. Well, that's not necessarily what I want. So what I want to do is go to second window or table setup, Okay, and when you get to that table setup menu, it's going to ask you table start. That's actually not going to matter, so you can just arrow down, change in table. Again, it's not going to matter because we're going to arrow down to where it says independent, and we're going to scroll over, use your arrow to the right, and hit enter on ask. Now when we go back to our table or second graph, it appears that our table is sort of empty. And the only reason it appears empty for us right now is that it's waiting for us to type in our x values that we want to calculate in the function that we typed into y equals. So again, make sure if you're trying to calculate this function right here in y1, that when you look at your table, you're looking in the y1 column for those outputs. So I'm going to say my first input was x equals 1, which we knew to be an output of 24. And then 2, enter, is my second input, um, so that would be 16. And so I have the point to 16. Again, I don't know that many calculus teachers are going to need to see that computation, but they're going to for sure want to see your idea that the average velocity or average rate of change is in fact slope. So I'm going to use the formulas that we looked at earlier. I'm going to say y sub 2, which I'll call 16, minus 24 over the 2 minus 1. So this is the prerequisite skill of calculating slope. So I should get negative 8. So I'm going to say negative 8, and I'm going to leave this blank here for a second. I'm going to come back to something else there. So I would do this again and again and again and again, but only for this next one, I'm going from one to one and a half. So I'm going from 124, which I know because I calculated it in the previous problem, to 1.5 something. So again, I would probably just go back to my calculator and type in 1.5 and I get 24. Okay, and then I would calculate the slope between those two. So hopefully if we recognize that those y values are the same, it will look like a horizontal line connecting them. So this is zero, and again I'm going to fill in something else here at the end. The third one is just very repetitive now in terms of skills. I'm going still from that 1, 24 
to 1.1 comma something here. And so if I put 1.1 in for x or t in this case, I get 24.64. And what's also important is that you hover over the y value so you can see if it's actually just 24.64 or if there are more decimals behind it. Because there's only so much room in this column, so sometimes it just truncates or leaves off part of your decimal. But if you hover over it, it's going to show you what that decimal is. If it's irrational, you might have to do some computation by hand, or if it's trigonometric, things of that nature. You're going to want to do your calculations or computations by hand because you're going to need those as exact values. So 24.64, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Oops, that's a lot. So 24.64. So my slope here will be 24.64 minus 24, 1.1 minus 1. And what I think you'll be able to see once you do the subtraction, is when you're dividing by 1 tenth, it's really like you could multiply by 10 over 10, then you're just dividing by 1. So this will be 6.4. I'll do it two more times here. What I would suggest is maybe pause the video and see if you can get this fourth one on your own. We already know the point 124. And we're going to 1.01 something. Okay, I'll use my calculator. So this will be a new input here of 1.01. And again, I'm going to want to hover over that column. And yep, it's 0, 7, 8, 4. 24.0784. So when I'm doing my formula for slope, the y sub 2 minus y sub 1, or change in y over change in x, I actually get 0 0.0784. I don't need my calculator to subtract off that 24. And this just tells me to move the decimal 2 to the right, because then you're dividing by 1. So I get 7.84. And last but not least, so go ahead and pause your video or um, try to do this one on your own and then check back in. Again, please make sure that, you know, this is an exact decimal here, but please make sure that you use the whole decimal that it's showing you here and not just that um, rounded view that's in that column if you're using your calculator. So I have the two points here that you can go ahead and check, and now I'll calculate the slope. So here I am, and now I can see that if I multiply by 1,000 over 1,000, or if I move that decimal three places to the right in each, I should have 7.984. Now why did I leave such big boxes for these answers? Well, this is a scenario or a situation or some sort of application here. Um, and this should deserve a label or some units following these answers. So if I'm looking for average rate of change or really just slope, you can go back up to the idea of what is slope. So since slope was rise over run or change in y over change in x, that should also be for your units or labels. So this is the label for your output. And this will be the label for your input. Okay? So if you think of it as the change in y over change in x, our labels will be the same. Our output label which was in feet over our input label, which was in seconds. And if you're not sure, you can also take a look at your actual slope calculation. The 16 and the 24 were our outputs or our y values, which was our height in feet, followed by dividing in the denominator by 2 minus 1, which were our time intervals, 
which were given in seconds. So all of these should have labels of feet per second. Now, you will also talk about in calculus, what does zero feet per second really mean, okay? And you'll also talk about the follow-up to that problem, the instantaneous velocity. Now just wrapping up the idea of average rate of change or slope here before you get to your calculus problems, what if we were given not necessarily a function in terms of an equation to use, but instead its graph? And so if I'm asking you to determine the average rate of change of the function below, again, this is an interval. I can see the brackets going from negative one to two, so that's an input from negative one, so I'm gonna put a point here, to x equals two, and I'll put that point right there. And I'm just gonna write these as their ordered pairs. So it's negative one comma two, right, x comma y, to two comma negative four. And now I'm just finding the slope between these two points exactly how we did before. Just watch your signs. So y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, or change in y over change in x. So I have negative six over two plus one is three. So that average rate of change or slope is negative two. And you'll talk about what that means graphically because if I connect these with a straight line, maybe something like that, and I look at what is the slope of that line, it's approximately negative two. That's a fair assessment. All right, last but not least, what if we were not given a graph, but what if we are given a table or some data to work with? So I pulled some data. The following table shows the amount of full-time students PVCC had each fall semester during the years 2014 to 2019. So the students are on top and the years are on the bottom. That does not necessarily dictate what is your input and what is your output. Most oftentimes we talk about how many students per year. Because the students changing per year, are we increasing so many students per year? Are we decreasing so many students per year, et cetera? And we can talk about the average rate of change um, in years that are maybe far apart. So over maybe a decade, what has our average been? Or we can look year over year. So we want our students, if you wanna think of this in terms of your output and input and slope formula, we want our students to actually be our y values. So from 2015 to 2017, so I'm gonna write my points like this. 2015 is gonna be my input, and most often times the time is your input. So I'm looking 2015 to 2017. So I'll write those out as points. Now, oftentimes also they might say let year 2014 be year zero or the starting year, so you could do it that way as well. Okay, so my slope, I'll just use that formula, 8447 minus 8684, there we go, over 2017 minus 2015, so I'll do that calculation. So if I subtract that, I do get a negative 237 over two. And I'm gonna say approximately here because negative 118.5 students per year. So that would be my label. Now, some people might argue, well, I really can't have half of a student increase or decrease, but again, an average is talking about over time. 
So I could understand your rounding. I guess it just depends on your application. And then we'll go into an instantaneous rate of change. That'll be your calculus discussion. I hope you found this review helpful and it will make you that much more successful when you get to your calculus conversations.